So let's talk about the very first one. If you are coming into this business, and let's take it on a practice basis in the business. How many of you have been to uh, script and dialogue practices and training? Anybody? Yep. Good. Good. Okay. What are the scripts focused on? Besides EW EWTS Wednesday, outside of that, what are they all focused on? Selling or handling objections. Okay. Yep. On what though? Just on converting a lead to a appointment, <laughs> right? Think about that. Think about what you get in the majority of script and dialogue practices out there. It is about converting a lead to an actual appointment, right? So if we think about that process, is that all of the entire transaction? Is that nope. everything we need to know? No. Does somebody ever say, okay, pull out your listing presentation and let's practice your listing presentation? Not often, right? How about let's go over a buyer agency agreement document and practice your buyer agency agreement conversion? Not necessarily, right? So you think about the practice that we do and that is standard for how we are approaching the industry. It's not the entire process. But if you think about a professional athlete or an Olympic athlete, are they just practicing? Tokara, is the only thing you're practicing a free throw? No, no, practice much more than that. Are you sure? But that would be the same thing as what we're doing in real estate, right? Nah, it, it takes more than that. I got to do more than just a free throw. See, free throw is situational. Exactly, right? And so is a lead conversion script. So when you think about this process and we talk about the practice aspects of real estate, practice should be part of your daily activities, should be part of the daily habit that, you, that you've got on your calendar. If we're not practicing our craft, do we get better? No. Do we have an opportunity to prepare prior to actually having the situation arise? No, we don't. So that's why that piece is big. Second one, learning. How much do you know about the market? If I ask you, and Takar, you said this earlier too, how's the market going? How's the market treating you? Okay, do we all know what's going on in our market? Maybe, but is that the only question that we're going to get? Is that the only piece of knowledge that you need? No. No, we need more. You do, right? So if somebody says, well, I've got a property. Um, I don't really want to do the taxes on it. I've got a big gain on it. Um, what are my options? Do you have the expertise to answer that question? Could you direct them to a 1031 exchange? Would it even be part of what you just thought of to do that, right? Here's the other piece. If somebody says, well, how's this neighborhood different than our overall market? Do you have the knowledge and the background? And are you looking at increasing your knowledge to be able to do an absorption rate analysis between a neighborhood and an area. Could you have a seller's market in an overall area, but a buyer's market in a specific neighborhood? Yes, yes. right? Would that affect your conversation when you're talking to a prospective buyer or seller that's in the neighborhood that's a buyer's market that's different than the overall seller's market in your area? Of course it would, right? So when you're thinking about the knowledge aspect of it, that's a piece that should be in your calendar on a daily basis, increasing your knowledge on all kinds of aspects of the real estate market. Okay. Number three, dollar productive activity. And we're going to go over these in details. And by the way, I'm going to show you specifically the increase that you can have when you work on these things for the next 30 and 60 days. Dollar productive activity, i.e. outbound lead generation. How many of you have to-do lists and checkoff lists that you go through on a daily basis? Anybody have one of those? Okay, throw it away. Oh, MJ just had a cringe, didn't you? <laughs> right. Okay. So uh, uh, don't necessarily throw it away. But here's the question for you. Are there more than three things on that list? Okay. Three major pieces. And this is the same thing with DPA. When you put on your calendar and you have this piece on your calendar that you are going to be do doing dollar productive activity during, I don't know, 8 and 9 a.m. Anybody know why I say 8 and 9 a.m.? Come on, somebody, somebody. Supposedly, they answer the phone more during that time. Four times more likely to answer the phone between 8 and 9 and 4 and 5. So why would you not do your outbound lead generation between eight and nine and four and five, right? But here's the other piece of that. Does DPA time include taking a buyer and showing them properties? Everybody do this. No, it does not. Does DPA time include going to an inspection? Everybody do this. No. DPA, dollar productive activity. It is the activities that you are doing at that point in time on that focused narrow point of time to generate a new buyer or seller. If it is not in that category, if they're already signed to you with a buyer agency or a listing agreement, that's not DPA. 
Does this make sense? Okay. Unless you talk to the buyer, the inspector about buying or selling. Yes, that that could that would count as a real estate conversation. You got it. All right. Number four, and guys, this is where we're going to get into the difficulty piece of it. How many of you can go run around your block without falling over and keeling over? <laughs> Our last. <laughs> All right. So here's the big piece of this. Are you doing something to keep yourself sharp and to keep your energy up? Because this business is a long-term play. It is not something that's an overnight thing. And neither are you. If you will do something on a daily basis to get yourself moving, keep your brain going, get outside, do those things, you will see a difference as well. Number five, AM, PM bookend. When does your day start? Emma, you can't answer this. When does your day start? 5 a.m. for me. Okay. Uh, oh, no. Uh, nice to see you, buddy. Very good. good. The night before. Why the night before? Why the night before? So because you're the staff preparation. You got it. You're reviewing the day. You're coming up with the three wins that you did that day. You're doing the gratitude piece of what you're thankful for for the day. By the way, you'd be amazed, scientifically proven that this makes a difference in your success. And you're setting your focus for the next day. So let's go backwards on those. And by the way, your AM PM is reviewing what you're doing for that day and then having a meditation, silence, making sure that you're on the right track, and then a focus section. So let's start with your PM bookend and let's go into detail on this. So when my daughter was starting out and really got serious into her sport, she would end her day by looking at what she accomplished that day. And she would write down the things that she did well, because that's a pat on the back, right? The second thing is she would write down the things that she was grateful for. The third thing is she would write down the things that she would be focused on for the next day. Now, think about this. There is actually, Michael, Michael Phelps tells a story about how he was having a challenge with his, one of his flip turns. And I don't remember if it was backstroke or freestyle, but he was having a challenge with his flip turn. And so what he did is he went to bed that night and he started picturing it in his mind. He wrote it down about how he wanted to execute the flip turn. This guy, this is Michael Phelps, by the way, already had been to two Olympics and won multiple gold medals. Okay? So this is in between. And he thought about it. What that does is it gets your brain thinking about the challenge and to find the solution while you're sleeping. The next morning, he did practice. The flip turn, he'd taken a half a second off of his flip turn. That's massive, right? That's huge. So Mary did the same thing. She would go to sleep and she would practice the things that she was going to do the next day before she ever woke up to do the things the next day. If you do that, especially if you have a challenge, if you have a presentation, if you have a, a call that you're going to make, you will have the same thing because your brain will give you a solution while you're sleeping before you ever wake up the next day. Again, Harvard studies, medical studies all over the place have shown that this works and is effective. If you're a professional athlete, you do this, especially as a high level professional athlete. Okay? This is called a PM bookend. This is the end of the day, but it's the start to your very next day. When you wake up, you go back through that focus of the day, do your meditations, do your silence, whatever you're going to do. By the way, what's the one thing that you want to keep away at least an hour before you go to sleep and an hour after you wake up? This is going to be a challenge for a lot of you. Yes, Dave Rupp, thank you. Electronics, screens, all of those different things. Turn those things off and get yourself in the right mindset. This is long-term peace. This is long-term success practices as we go through this. It will make a difference in you when you do this. If you turned off your phone and just cut down off your on your phone for 25 minutes a day for the next year, some of you know this, you will gain 3.8 weeks of 40 hour work weeks back to your life. 152 hours just by cutting out your screen time or your social media by 25 minutes a day. What could you do with an extra 152 hours a year? What could you do with 3.8 full time work weeks every year? Anybody do a little bit more or have a little bit more family time or more vacation time or whatever it is? Yes, 